Hi, I'm Konstantin Baum, Master of Wine, and I feel like challenging myself. Exactly 10 years ago, I set the world's most difficult tasting exam, the Master of Wine, and today I want to find out whether I still got it. I asked Leon to pick out some old exam questions and order the exact same wines for me to taste blind. I might have to give back my Master of Wine qualification after this video comes out, but let's go. In 1953, the first Master of Wine exam was held in London, and out of the 21 people who took it, only six passed. Today, this terrible pass rate would actually be considered pretty high, as the exam is notoriously difficult. This is one of the reasons why there are only 414 Masters of Wine on this planet. The most challenging part of the exam is the blind tasting, where you have to identify 36 wines blind on three exam days. On each exam day, you have 12 wines in front of you and you have to write answers identifying the wines grape variety, origin, maturity, vintage, winemaking, and so on. Needless to say, you have to be very well prepared in order to pass the exam. And I was on top of my game when I sat down in the exam room. Regardless, you feel the nerves as the pressure is enormous. And I've seen people give up, cry, or storm off during the exam week. Good times. Today, I will do the exam light, six wines, but this is still going to be challenging as I'm not really prepared for this. And on top of that, I have the sniffles, but that's the excuse everyone uses before doing a blind tasting. In the exam, you have roughly 11 minutes per wine for identifying the wine and writing fairly long answers. So I always stayed on top of my timekeeping and had this digital countdown clock to make sure that I answer all of the questions. I also always numbered my glasses to make sure that I don't mix them up. That's kind of the worst thing that can happen. You identify the wines correctly, but you have them in the wrong order. In the exam, all 12 wines are given to you, so you are responsible for pouring them into the right glass. And if you now think, oh, that's great, because you can sometimes tell what the wine might be from the shape of the bottle, Nope, they actually pour all wines into carafes or blank bottles, so you don't know anything about the wine apart from what you see, smell and taste. And then they bring out the top secret questions. No one knows beforehand what the questions might be. Even most masters of wine don't. Only the people responsible for setting up the tasting exam know and, well, I don't know what's in there, so let's find out. All right, I'm starting off with the first flight, which consists of these four wines. There will be another two wines later on. The first flight is from paper one. Paper one is usually white wine only. Paper two is red wine only. And then paper three is basically a mixed bag. It could be anything from rosé to sparkling wine to whatever. So the question from paper one is, Wines 9 to 12 are from the same country. There are three single grape varieties represented. For all four wines, do the following things. Name the country and the three grape varieties, referencing all four wines. For each wine, comment on the winemaking, comment on the quality and market potential. Easy. All right, so first of all, you have to really look at the details in the questions. There are four wines, but three grape varieties. So... There will be the same grape variety twice in the mix and all of those four wines are from one country. So this does narrow down the scope of this project because some countries might not be relevant in the tasting like that because well, they are not producing too many different styles or don't use too many different grape varieties. And all of the wines that are in the tasting have to be relevant on the market in one way or another. That doesn't necessarily mean a lot, but like really esoteric, weird countries will probably not be featured in the exam showcasing for wines from that place. So those are all things you have to bear in mind during the exam. But now let's dig into the wines. Shall we? So there's no standard way to approach this, but I always smelled all of the wines first. Usually I smelled all of the 12 wines first before reading the questions. But in this case, I only have those four in order to see whether there are any bankers. So wines that I can identify easily. And I think one of these wines at least is a wine that I can identify only by smelling it. So after tasting all four wines, I think I know quite a few more things about those wines, the origin and the grape variety. 
First of all, it must be a country with a variable climate. So there must be some regions that are fairly cool and some regions that are a little bit warmer because these ones show, well, some of them show lots of freshness and some show more concentration and richness. I also think there's it's a winemaking country where not everything has to be pristine and clean. So this doesn't necessarily feel like the new world. It feels like some wines, particularly wine number two, are a little bit uh, wilder, a little bit less um, less precise, I'd say. Not saying that this is a bad wine, but it's just it doesn't feel super controlled. So I would maybe move away from the new world here. And yeah, when it comes to grape varieties, it's interesting. I mean, there are there's one wine that is more aromatic in flavor, which is wine four. And wine three also has some flavor there. And one and two are more, well, less fruit driven, more oxidative, a little bit influenced by oak aging, maybe even oak fermentation. Well, this doesn't really get me anywhere because everyone in every winemaking country could use different ways to make their wine. So when it comes to the grape varieties, I'm pretty sure that this is Sauvignon Blanc, a grape variety that is very aromatic and usually combines green and grassy notes with more exotic fruit flavor. And this, I think, is Sauvignon. I'm, I'm pretty sure about this. When it comes to the others, the first one feels quite Chardonnay-esque Chardonnay to me. And the second one also, to be honest, but it's slightly different though. Um, but yeah, I, I would say this is Chardonnay because of this combi combination of citrus flavor, oaky influence, good freshness, good body, like medium body, maybe alcohol levels around 13, 13 and a half percent. This is a little bit bigger, a little bit broader, has more dusty and wild flavors together with the oakiness that comes from the fermentation and maturation in oak. Wine number three is interesting. It's not very aromatic. It smells of lemon, but also kind of spicy, a little bit wooly, waxy, which for me points towards Chenin Blanc. And... If that was a Chenna, this is Sauvignon, this is Chardonnay, and this, well, one of those three grape varieties, then I think the selection of winemaking countries is quite small. The only two countries I could think of using those three grape varieties on a larger scale are France and South Africa. In France, they use Sauvignon and Chenin in the Loire, and Sauvignon is also very important in Bordeaux. Chardonnay is obviously the most important white grape variety in Burgundy, but all three grape varieties are planted in different regions as well. In South Africa, all three of these grape varieties are planted all over, and South Africa has become fairly well known for Chenin Blanc. There are other places that use these three grape varieties also. Heck, I even think in Germany there's probably some production of Chenin Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay are definitely produced here, but they wouldn't put a German Chenin Blanc in the exam. I would think. So wine one could be a Chardonnay from Burgundy and wine four could be a Sauvignon Blanc from somewhere in the Centre Loire. But I'm starting to think that wine number two is actually also a Chenin Blanc, but a more high-end one fermented and aged in oak. And this is a more entry-level Chenin Blanc. And that just doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't think they would put three wines from the same region into a question, into a paper like that. I know one shouldn't second guess the examiners, but sometimes you have to kind of play a little bit of chess as well to get through the exam. So I know I said, I don't think it's from the new world, but actually South African wines sometimes can taste like they are from the old world. And I'm sometimes a little bit less clean. I mean, that's just my opinion, but but I find that they are not as as tidy as a lot of the new world wines are. And that definitely isn't a bad thing. I, I sometimes think that's quite interesting about South African wines. And on top of that, I'm starting to think Leon selected this question and these wines. And he knows that I'm weak when it comes to South African wines in blind tasting. So I think, 
I'm on to him, Leon. I'm on to you. When it comes to winemaking and market potential, I won't go into as much detail as they would usually request in an exam like this, but I think this is pretty high end, probably retails for around 30 US dollars, something like that, and it was fermented and aged in French oak vessels. This is probably on the same, on a similar level. It was also aged in oak and fermented in oak, but probably in older barrels. And well, they, it has quite a lot of oxidation and funk. So I'm guessing this is fermented spontaneously. This might be too. Wine number three is more pristine and clean. I would say this is like a stainless steel, cold ferment, Chenin Blanc retailing for 15, 15 US dollars roughly. And this is a good uh, Sauvignon Blanc. I would say it's probably in the 15 to 20 US dollar range. Also fermented in stainless steel, um, not nothing to rave about, but a good quality Sauvignon Blanc. In the written exam, they would definitely want me to write a whole paragraph on the winemaking and the quality and market potential. And I would have to go through the whole process of winemaking, when the grapes were picked, how ripe they were, how it was fermented, how long it stayed in barrel and so on and so forth. And when it comes to quality and market potential, they would definitely want me to write down what the value of the wine is, where this wine could be sold, high-end restaurants, supermarkets, all that kind of stuff. But I'm not going to go into that. So let's move on to the next part of the exam. And these are sparkling wines. I seem to remember that in the exam, whenever there was one or several sparkling wines in the lineup, we actually had to leave the room and they would pour the wines for us because otherwise it would have been too difficult to get them well, carafe without losing too much CO2. So, well, you come back, you have these glasses in front of you, you see the question and you just go. So this question was actually designed for four wines, but I'm only going to do two or Leon just picked two of the four wines. The question is wines one to four are traditional method sparkling wines from four different countries. None is from Champagne. For each wine, identify the origin and grape variety as closely as possible. Comment on the quality in the context of origin and state the residual sugar. Easy. So not having champagne in there is actually quite an interesting approach because there's quite a lot of great sparkling wine being produced all around the world. You don't have to go to champagne, but champagne is still, well, they're, they're still producing pretty good sparkling wines. So we know this is not from Champagne, but this leaves us with pretty much every other winemaking country because sparkling wine is made everywhere. When one is pretty golden in color, which points to a longer maturation on the lees, and it has a fine mousse, which is also consistent of longer maturation on the lees, the nose for me is pretty typical for Cava. It has this Fruit flavor, a little bit more intense than uh, some sparkling wines from Champagne, for example, but also a little dustiness, spicy notes. So this feels very much like a high-end cava. Also on the texture, it is a little bit less acidic. There's less like grippy, fresh acidity, a little bit more round and plush mouthfeel. Quite a lot of the sparkling wines in other parts of the world are actually based on the Champagne recipe because it's so successful. So they use Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, maybe Pinot Meunier. And this doesn't feel like any of the grape varieties. It feels more distinct. So, so I'm pretty sure that this is Cava, but you, you never know. Wine number two is a much bigger challenge. I mean, this First of all, it looks very light in color. It looks like a Prosecco, so it doesn't look like a wine that was matured on the lease for a long time. Maybe it wasn't even fermented in bottle, but in tank. It is not very fruity. There's not a lot of flavor coming out of the glass. It's more delicate. It smells of apple, a little bit of pear. Really delicate flavors. And not a lot of lease flavor, again, suggesting that this might not have been aged on the lease for a long time. Maybe not even fermented in bottle. On the palate, it's kind of fresh. There seems to be a little bit of residual sugar. The acidity is a little bit harsh. Well, 
difficult. So I would say this is a high-end cava made from the traditional grape varieties Paralada, Xarello and Macabeu. I would say this retails for maybe 25, 30 US dollars. Cava tends to be fairly cheap. So even the good ones are still fairly affordable. And I would say the residual sugar here is very low, maybe four grams. I don't know. Wine number two is much more difficult for me. I think this tastes German. It's not a high-end sparkling wine. It's probably made using a grape variety that is fairly neutral. So I could see this being a Weissburgunder Sekt, um, like around the nine euro mark. Pretty basic uh, quality, well made, but nothing to rave about. And this feels actually fairly sweet. So there might be somewhere around 10 grams of residual sugar in here. Definitely not aged on the lease for a long time, but maybe made uh, in a traditional method, so fermented in bottle and then aged for a short amount of time on the lees in the bottle. All right, this was kind of exhausting and I only did six wines. So after the actual exam, I was really exhausted and I didn't really know what to think. You will learn what the wines were a few days after the exam and then you'll get your results a few months later. So there's definitely a lot of waiting time after sitting the exam before getting good or bad news. But in this case, we'll find out right now what the wines were. So let's unwrap them all at once. The first four ones, I thought they were from South Africa. But to be honest, just because I think Leon wants to trick me here, I thought this was a Chardonnay. So let's see. Ha! I knew it. I knew it. So this is a Chardonnay from South Africa. It's from Hamilton Russell Vineyards, actually a very famous winery. I recently tasted some of their wines at the Master of Wine Symposium. So I could have identified this wine. I didn't, but but it's it's a pretty beautiful Chardonnay from South Africa. So this should also be from South Africa. And I said this was a Chenin Blanc, a high-end Chenin Blanc, and it is... David and Nadia's Chenin Blanc 2020. I don't really know this brand, but well, I'm guessing that this is a fairly high-end wine. Leon left me some notes here, so I can have a look. Yeah, this is actually retailing for 30 euros, so I was pretty good. Feeling good right now. So let's see, what's this? Petit Chenin Blanc from Ken Forrester. I think we had a Ken Forrester wine before on this channel. And this is, I guess, their entry-level Chenin. If they call it Petit, it's probably not the best wine they make, but it's pretty good. So if this is a Sauvignon Blanc, I feel really good about myself. And I'm pretty sure this is a Sauvignon Blanc because that's just a great variety that is easy to identify. So let's see. Southern Rich Sauvignon Blanc. Man, this feels good. So the first four ones were pretty much spot on. I obviously would have had to write a long answer detailing all the information that they are they are requesting from me. I didn't do that, but like identifying those ones right would already help me. But remember, this is just a third of the paper, so I could have still failed this paper getting most of the other wines wrong. So let's check out the last two wines. This I thought was a Cava and I feel pretty confident because, well, it just tasted a lot like a Cava. So let's see. Yes, it is a Cava and it's one of those classic wines from this category. So it's definitely a wine that you can identify. It's a Brut Nature, and I thought this had four grams, I think I said, but this is probably more around the zero gram per liter mark. So let's see about the last one, which I don't feel confident about at all. I thought this was quite difficult to identify. Maybe in the lineup of four wines, this would have been easier because you well, could have already eliminated some origins before getting to this one, and then this might have been easier to pick. So let's see. Cremant d'Alsace. 
Clément Clur. It's a Clément, d'Alsace. And I said, it's from Germany, so, so I'm definitely in the wrong country here. I also... Well, this contains Pinot Gris, Riesling, Chardonnay, Oxoroa, and Pinot Blanc. So I thought this was just Pinot Blanc. I thought it was a little, well, a little bland. And maybe I just didn't pick up on the aromatic flavors coming from the Riesling, I guess. So this was an interesting tasting. It was definitely challenging for me. And I think I got a little bit lucky getting those four wines into the right country after thinking they couldn't be from the new world. It goes to show that blind tastings can be fun, but the Master of Wine exam isn't a lot of fun. It's hard work. And I feel exhausted after tasting these six wines. So you can imagine how people feel after doing this 36 times. So I'm keeping my Master of Wine pin. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then please like it down here. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. My question of the day is what do you think about blind tastings and are you going to attempt the master of wine let me know down below i hope i see you guys very soon until then stay thirsty